And we begin this series of countdown to the tribulation with the message, Christ is coming. And for 13 lessons, we've tried to show you we're on the threshold of that moment. So I close this series with the message, the second coming of Christ. Reading here from the Gospel of John, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. One of these days, a startled world is going to experience the most glorious event in the entire history of time. I have tried to betray to you that that moment is upon us right now. Prophets have proclaimed it. Angels have sang it. The mouth of the Lord Jesus himself has spoken it. One day the skies are going to open and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the nail-pierced feet of the man of Galilee are going to step out of those gates of pearl and come again to this world of sin and iniquity. Every nation on earth will stagger beneath the unfolding of fulfilled prophecy when Jesus comes back to claim his own. The devil has the world blinded and the church asleep on the question of the second coming of the Lord Jesus. It's a spiritual truth that only spiritual eyes can see. And it's a spiritual truth that only spiritual minds can discern. It's a spiritual truth that an apostate church doesn't want to believe because she will not be ready to meet him when he comes. It's a glorious reality to the man that knows the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. And it's an undying, unveiling hope to the one who has been and is at this moment filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus is coming again. Mark it down. Why do you say that? I said, number one, because Jesus himself said he's coming again. He's also coming again because the scriptures teach and declare that his second coming is an integral part of God's redemptive plan. Without the second coming of Christ, God's revealed will for the redemption of the lost would be incomplete. He came the first time to die. We know he's coming the second time to rule. He came the first time <clears throat> to climb the steps of Golgotha. But he comes the second time to climb the steps to a royal throne. The prince of the house of David will once again behold Jerusalem. And where he once wept, there'll be a shout of victory. Where he once bore a cross, he will wear a crown. Oh, what a glorious prospect for the overcoming Christian. Jesus is coming. Why? Why is there so much doubt in the minds of so many people regarding the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very mention of the fact that you believe in the premillennial return of the Lord Jesus Christ arouses more bitter antagonism in some quarters than all the preaching of divine healing, the baptism of the Holy Ghost put together. Yet, listen to me, out of 276 chapters in the New Testament, the second coming of Christ is referred to no less than 318 times. The very first prophet of the Old Testament, 
Old Testament prophesied relative to the second coming of the Lord. For we read in Jude verse 14, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. From that marvelous declaration to the last two verses of the last book of the Bible, which states he testifies, these things saith surely, I come quickly, amen. The Bible is full of his coming. From the beginning to the end of the, of the word, the word of God literally shouts the fact of his coming. But in the next place, he said himself that he was coming again. That should be enough. And all the proof that any man ever needs is the fact that Christ himself told us that he was coming again. He declared in no uncertain terms to the disciples. Their hearts were broken because the fact that he's going away. And to comfort them, he said to them, I will come again. And the only provision made with the promise was these words, if I go away. So I ask the question, did he go away? We know, we know that he did. Climb with me for a moment to the steps of the Mount of Olives. Stand with me in the Spirit with Peter, James, and John. Their eyes are looking up, even as ours will someday, soon, I believe, uh, be looking up. The only difference, they're watching him go away, and we will watch him return. Their Lord has departed. His words are ringing in their ears. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It was a triumphant event. In his going, he's conquered the grave, had broken the powers of death. Death was now a captive in chains in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that victory, down through the corridors of time have come a message of triumph to a world shrouded in death. It's a message of hope to the hopeless. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And then referring to the day in which he, he would come again, he said, He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Further angels proclaim the fact of his coming. Thank God they were not mistaken. They came to earth to give emphasis to the glorious truth that the watching disciples already knew. It was while they were watching him go that God the Father sent two white robed beings from angels, from heaven rather, to remind them that Jesus would come back. Now while they're watching him go, the angels declared to them that this same Jesus, thank God for that, the same Jesus, not a spirit, not an influence, not a system, not a power, but the same Jesus, the same Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee, who healed the sick, who cast out the demons, fed the multitude, who walked and talked among the sons of men, that same Jesus is coming back to this earth again. Now, having settled the fact of his coming, we come to this question, how is he coming? Now, the only place we have a right to get the answer is the Word of God. The Word of God has the answer to all our questions if we'll but look. All of the great doctrinal truths of God's Word are set forth in plain everyday language so that those who are hungry for the truth don't have to miss it. How is He coming? The Scripture is just as clear on this point as they are regarding the fact of His coming. Why 
to people's spiritual lives the plain, literal statement of the Word of God. Why do people try to rob the church of this blessed hope of the Savior's coming by taking a plain, matter-of-fact, biblical statement and twist it out of its pure meaning? Now, in the first chapter of Acts, verse 10 and verse number 11, we read the manner here of the Lord's return. Now, let us examine it carefully for a moment. Let's just examine the scene. We know the scene. The disciples are standing, gazing steadfastly into heaven. Their emotions are aflame as they watch the ascending Lord. Now, as they're standing, gazing up, watching him go suddenly, there come two angels from God, and the angels ask the question, Why stand you gazing into the heaven? Now, what made those angels say that? It was as if they said, He's gone now. It's time to stop looking for His going away. You must now begin to look and expect Him to come back. Hardly. Had he despair, disappeared, then the news was flashed back to earth that he was coming back. Now, listen, this was not a message of some harebrained fanatics. These are messages from God. The same Jesus said the angels is coming back again. <clears throat> but how is he coming? Here are the angels. In same like manner, in the same way that he went, he's going to come back. <clears throat> There's no room for argument. In the same like manner as he went up, in that identical manner, he will return. How did he go? He went away visibly, bodily, and personally. They watched him go. So shall he return visibly and bodily, he'll come back. He went in the clouds, Acts 1 and 9. Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with the cloud, and every eye shall see him. He went with the clouds, he'll return with the clouds. How's he coming? He's coming with a shout. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. First Thessalonians 4.16 If ever all the hosts of heaven are gathered to do him honor, it must be in that great day, the day of his triumph, the day of his victory, for he's coming back for us redeemed. No wonder the trumpet will blow. No wonder the voice of the archangel will sound. No wonder the shout will echo and re-echo throughout this universe. He is coming with a shout. In like manner, in like manner, his coming will be twofold. He will come for his church and he will return with his church. First, his appearance in the air. We shall rise to meet him while a wicked, sinful world reels under the terror of the tribulation we've talked so much about. We will be with Jesus. The tribulation will head up in that terrible conflict known as Armageddon. But the warfare will only stop when the Prince of Peace comes to establish peace. Listen to it. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 and 4. In like manner, he went from the Mount of Olives, and he will come back upon the Mount of Olives. He went with the clouds. He will return with the clouds. Not another, but the same Jesus. What will happen when he comes? Again, 
we must go to the Word of God. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain alive, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. In every town, every village, there's a city of the dead. Side by side, saved and unsaved, have been placed beneath the earth. Old men have lived out their lives. Children have died early in life. Old and young, saint and sinner, lay side by side in that silent city of the dead. The cemetery has been the scene of terrible sorrows. Broken-hearted parents have laid their sons and daughters away. Children have laid their parents away. Many are the tears that have been shed here, and the devil has laughed as he watched. Flowers decorated the mounds, but even the flowers had to die. Death reigns now in this day of the devil. Now is a day of sorrow. But there is coming another day. It is a day of the resurrection. It's a day of Jesus come again. The world will echo with the trump of God. The corridors of human lives will vibrate with the voice of the archangel. Jesus will appear brighter than the brightness of the sun. In an instant, where the years have packed the earth, there'll be a gaping hole. The graves are opening. Men and women, young and old, are rising because he came to break the powers of death. Looking upward, they behold him. And with a shout of joy, upward, 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 we'll go to meet him. Death, where is thy victory? Grave, where is thy sting? What a day that will be, and surely that's not too far in the future. Jesus said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up, for redemption draweth nigh. We know redemption has drew nigh many times in history. He came to his church, but now he's about to come for us. Not all will rise. Not all will come out of the graves. Only the dead in Christ will rise. Only those who remain, who are alive, rather than remain alive, those who are spiritually alive at that moment in time, the rest of the dead, those who rejected God's offer of pardon, will stay in the grip of death until the thousand years Years have passed. Those who carelessly allowed their oil to go away, uh, or to run out, and their lamps to go out, will not be a part of that raptured church. No, the entire church the, will not go to meet him. The real true church will go, but not those that become careless in their lives, not the cold, formal, ritualistic, imitation church, not the theater-going, liquor-sipping type of church, not the lukewarm. Christ said he'd spew that crowd out of his mouth, but the real church, the Holy Ghost-filled church, the bride of Christ, the church that has on the wedding garment shall rise to meet him. The question now, will you be ready to meet him? Will your heart be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will you be filled with the Holy Ghost? The only way to be ready then is to ready, be ready now. Are you filled with God? Are you alive unto God?